And we are at the Aquatic Centre at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London. In 2012, Britain's Paralympians repeatedly struck gold in this pool. Four years on, athletes have arrived back home from Rio with their record haul of medals. But what is everyday life like for disabled people who aren't superhuman? Tonight, 50 disabled people will debate live with a government minister about why many of them can't find a job, travel easily on public transport or go out at night, and why many face discrimination every day. So join us in 20 minutes for No Go Britain, the disability debate. Well, now for our No Go Britain disability debate. Over to Jackie Long at the Olympic Park in East London. Jackie. Good evening from the Aquatic Centre in London's Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park for our No Go Britain disability debate. This impressive centre, designed by the late architect Zaha Hadid, includes many features specifically to help those with disabilities. That's a legacy of the 2012 Paralympics. But as we've been revealing this year on Channel 4 News, many barriers remain for disabled people in their everyday lives. Tonight, we have brought many of those who have featured in our films face to face with a government minister to talk about almost every aspect of their lives, how they're viewed by others, how difficult it is to find work, to travel around, go out, and often just to get by. Today, athletes from Britain's Paralympics team arrived back at London's Heathrow Airport with the record haul of 147 medals they won at Rio. 64 of them were gold. That surpasses the extraordinary achievements we saw here at this Olympic Park four years ago. But what is it like if you're not superhuman? In a survey we did this year, one in three young disabled people said they'd experienced discrimination since the last Paralympics. One in four said they'd been patronised. And a study last month found that disabled people are more likely to worry about being victims of crime than those who aren't. We've also reported on how hard it is to find accessible public toilets, to travel on public transport and to go out. Take a look, what do you see? They've wowed us with their superhuman feats, the Paralympians, covered in gold for their efforts. But what's life like if you're disabled and not a medal-winning athlete? Look, I've got three! <laughs> for the past year, we've been looking at the barriers many face, when living an ordinary life takes a superhuman effort. Where is it? From the most basic of needs. And I'm just waiting to notice there's a hook so I don't have to put my handbag on the floor. But it's absolutely fine to put my daughter on the floor to change her. To the daily abuse that becomes part of normal life for some. Shatter things like, you know, oh, that woman makes me want to vomit. People with assistance dogs being told they can't come in. Maybe they think I put a harness on my pet dog just so that I could take him <laughs> to restaurants. And a transport system that's just no go. You can only get on if you dismantle it and carry it on yourself. Uh, I said if I could do that, I wouldn't need the scooter in the first place. Tonight, we debate how to make Britain truly accessible to all. Well, we're going to be talking about all those issues now with many of the people who've taken part in our No Go Britain series this year. And our panel, Margaret Hickish, is from Network Rail, who operate all the stations and platforms in our rail service. The Education and Skills Minister, Robert Halfen, and David Pearson from the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. We're also joined by a great panoply of guests as well. Um, one of the big legacies of the Paralympics in London was this sort of golden dawn, this idea that perceptions of what disabled people could achieve and how they would live would change. Has that changed, Jackie? Um, I think it has changed slightly, but not enough in the amount of time that we've had till now. Um, there are still many things such as uh, care that still needs to be looked at and how people can stay up late and public transport. There are just so many issues that still need to be readdressed. In terms of day-to-day -day life, Victoria, you, we saw you in one of our films. Day-to-day -day life at times seem pretty tough. Yeah, it can be. Um, it's certainly not easy for me. 
And uh, in my job, I co-run a network of young disabled campaigners called Trailblazers. So I hear every day stories of all the barriers they face trying to live their lives. And I think that the Paralympics is wonderful, but we shouldn't assume that because the public have embraced the Paralympics, that it means disabilism, disability prejudice doesn't exist anymore, because unfortunately it still does. Other people on perceptions, whether they've changed? Look, 40% of disabled people still feel like they need to hide their disability. That's new research done by Scope. That is because we don't feel equal in every walk of life, within our job, within our social life. We still feel that we're not treated like everybody else. So we feel that we can't be our authentic self. I mean, Paige, what about you? I mean, you told a pretty grim story in the film yeah. that you made which was about a violent yeah, attack. Yeah. Um, in November 2014, I was attacked in a nightclub. I was physically assaulted in a nightclub, um, unprovoked, just because I was there. Um, and to me, that still shows a massive um, inequality because that wouldn't have happened to me if I wasn't disabled. The language he was using was implying it was because of my disability and the fact that he just didn't like it. How much do you think that is a problem for the rest of society? Um, I think... With my course that I do, I'm very interested in journalism and I researched that and I found a lot of other young disabled people had had similar experiences um, to mine. So I think it's more prevalent than people actually um, assume it to be. I mean, in, in the last year we've been looking not just at perceptions but at practical things that it's sort of extraordinary that we're still talking about. Access to toilets. Jo, tell us about your experience looking after your daughter. Yeah, it's something I feel so passionately about, that everywhere that something that's social for people to do and enjoy it should have a changing places toilet. I find it outrageous in this day and age that my daughter has to be laid on a public toilet floor and I have to... A lift pretty her. filthy one in yeah, the film yes. we saw. Um, I have to lift her onto the floor to do that and lift her back up into her chair. A changing places toilet offers a hoist and a safe place to actually lay her so that as a parent carer we don't get injured for the future for looking after her continuously but also she has the dignity of being able to change in private and it to be something that's allowed for everybody I mean I'd like to say to the ministers today you know how would they feel about standing barefoot in a public toilet because that's basically what we have to do daily Robert Halfman the minister well um, first of all I agree with you um, I have, I was born with spastic di diplegia myself, I have walking issues. On, only on the weekend I was at a restaurant, which was at a modern restaurant with my wife, and there, when you said, where is the toilet, um, it was, they said down some stairs, which were very narrow, and then you had literally a half a mile walk to the toilet from the stairs. They then, uh, I then went, did that, and so on, and then at the end of the meal, I wanted to go to the toilet again but I thought I, no, I can't face doing the stairs so they said actually there's a public toilet for a disabled public toilet around the block so thinking how wonderful I went there of course it was locked and of course you need the key and of course I didn't have the key but so I, I'm well aware of these things but it, what it, is your government yeah. doing about it why are we still yeah. talking about this now going to the toilet the most basic of needs well, there are practical things that we need to do not just on toilets but on parking on, on a whole range of things. I, the Governor are looking at these things. The last disabled minister started a review into restaurants. Even when they have a disabled toilet, they often have the chairs stuck in the disabled toilet. And yes, we need to do a lot. There aren't easy answers always. Sometimes they're old buildings. What about legislation? I suspect that once the disability minister's finished her review into these kind of things, uh, that something substantial will, will come out. Because in my belief, we can help people with disabilities, whether well, it's your daughter, my own situation, whoever it may be. It's not helping people with disabilities. You're raising 12 billion austerity cuts. People are dying. There's thousands. How dare you? All How of dare you come on here and say that you're in the same position as other mums and kids, carers facing billions of cuts, the benefit cap. The £30 ESA cut, how dare you? Robert, how about I mean, respond to that. You voted for that ESA cut. So I wouldn't deny for one minute there haven't been painful decisions. Sorry, you did vote for that ESA yes, cut that I, the I ladies talking I'm not about. denying for, for one minute there haven't been painful decisions. But overall, overall, 
the country, and I'm proud of this, is spending 50 billion a year just on disability benefits. That's the second high, hang on, that's the second highest in the world. That is more than we spend on schools, billions more than we spend on schools, billions more than we spend on other areas. And I'm proud of that 50 billion, it's going up. So yes, there have been difficulties in some areas, but we are still spending 50 billion a year. And 50 billion a year, I don't even know what 5 billion is, let alone 50 billion. But there are people shaking their heads money. here who clearly don't feel the benefit of that spending, but who may, they clapped for the, the lady making the point about benefit mm. cuts and cuts to public spending. So why is their experience very different from the one you're suggesting? Well, as I say, there have been difficult decisions in terms of some benefits. And where there is injustice, we need to look at it, and we do. Dif but, difficult decisions. Your policies oh. are ideological policy designed to remove benefits from disabled people, designed to kill disabled people, designed to make disabled people homeless, designed to make people go disabled people go hungry, designed to exclude us from society. Don't deny it. You're killing disabled people. People in mental distress are taking their own lives. And I tell you something, it's about time that your government faced justice for the deaths of disabled people. Your government has blood on its hands from we the will deaths come of disabled back. people. So we will come back to the benefits issue, which I know is clearly one that touches an awful lot of people. But on the issue of accessibility, making life equal for people, Daniel, the, the, the issue of toilets is pretty basic. You're, you're, you've campaigned for hoists in hotels and public places. What do you want the government to do on that? Yeah, I want the government to, to, to make those changes so that when hotels are, are re, rebuilding new hotels, I want the government to make it lower because it, it's pretty difficult for me and my partner to, to basically plan uh, any time together away and even when we do this next expense involved it's everything about exp expense 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 with disability and i don't see why it should be david pearson I mean, the lga you under building regulations presumably could make companies put in these hoists make these toilets genuinely accessible for people? What's absolutely clear is that to meet the requirements and the, and the aspirations of disabled people, it needs a cross-government uh, approach and at local level, cross-organisations to work together to make sure that changing places, toilets happen, uh, that, that people have the access that they require, um, that care services are, require, are, are available to give people the individual choice of control. And the organisation I represent, ADAS, we've been working for uh, the last 20 years with disabled people who've cried out for personal budgets, choice and control. The problem is you're talking about 20 years and we're still talking yes, about the because, same problems. Yes, in and progress has been made. You cited this on some of your films. But clearly we are in the sixth year of austerity as far as social care budgets are concerned. Needs are rising in the way that we, we know across this country, and there is an issue about adequately funded social care services. But whose to make fault sure is that? Because who should they come to? Should they look there, at you, or should they look there is, at the government? There is clearly an issue about priorities for the government in terms of public expenditure. Is it your view that perhaps disabled people should take more of a priority than they're currently doing? We spend two percent, only two percent of our income uh, as a nation on social care, and it's falling. We have to make sure that the aspirations of the people in this room are met through making sure that there are adequately, adequately funded public services. Well, one of the other big issues is always transport. Gina, tell us a little bit about whether you think the rail system is getting any more accessible for people with disabilities. No, it's not. It's sort of come to a standstill. Nothing is improving. I had one journey where there was absolutely no problem on the outward journey. Just easy on the return journey totally different the driver would not let me on the train he told me as i've said before you must fold it up and carry it on and i said i can't do that if i could i would not need it it's no bigger than a wheelchair there is absolutely no reason for them not to so you can get on. one way but not the other not way the other. and this has happened to many many disabled people not just me it's 2016 when's it going to improve well, from network rail so one of the things we've been doing is educating people to understand just that, that it's not about making judgments. Um, since I joined Network Rail, we've changed the language we use. 
around being inclusive so people don't make judgments because that's the big thing is about them not making judgments but unfortunately it does come down to money doesn't it and didn't yeah. network rail cut 50 million off their access budget just this year well actually that was done on the basis of the report by sir peter hendy and although the access for all budget um meant that we are not working as fast on the stations as we were before they will still be made accessible how long will gina have to wait do you think well absolutely i i mean i do recognize that and what i can tell you that the access for all is not the only way we are making things more accessible gina next time i travel to visit family am i going to be allowed on this train to get me there so what i can tell you is that the association of train operators are looking at end-to-end -end journeys for disabled people they are looking at what the experiences are like and how that can be improved really seriously thinking about how what the personal experience... How personally disappointed do you feel at how slow this seems to be happening? Oh, inevitably. Um, as, as someone who uses the rail network all the time, I have to for work. Um, I know those, those sorts of experiences. I've had them too. The great thing about me having that sort of experience is that I can then go back and tell people this is not acceptable. So actually being inside Network Rail gives me far more voice to be able to get to perhaps more powerful people but do you more directly. Do you recognise that money and prioritisation is one of the problems? Absolutely. And what we've done is turned it into business as usual. So can Gina, we contact really you through Transport for All and get together and talk Absolutely, about this? Absolutely, but Transport for All, I often speak to Transport okay. for All, so please do. Okay, okay thank for you. the moment that is it, but after the break, more from our No Go Britain debate here at the London Aquatic Centre. Why is it so hard for many disabled people to find work and why are many not getting the care they need and struggling to get by? Welcome back to the Aquatic Centre in London's Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park for our No Go Britain disability debate. We, along with an audience made up of people we have featured in our reports this year, I'm also joined by Margaret Hickish from Network Rail, the Education and Skills Minister Robert Halfen, and David Pearson from the Local Government Association. Well, we're going to carry on our debate um, talking about some of the many issues. One I know is absolutely critical to a lot of people here, and it is social care budgets. Jackie, what's happened to yours? Um, so I've had a care budget since I was a teenager um, and I didn't need to use it as much just because the condition I have is progressive. So the older I get, the weaker I'm going to get. So my question is, why are care agencies and companies allowed to suggest at 7 o'clock bedtime when I'm a young person who wants to live spontaneously? Why do they have to tell me or dictate to me when I can and can't go to sleep? I mean, David Pearson, it's pretty disgraceful, isn't it? A grown woman having to go to bed the same time as a seven-year-old because of her disability. What we, what we absolutely want to do is to make sure that people can choose when they go to bed, how they live their lives, help to uh, go to work and meet your, your aspirations in terms of the way you want to live your life. And that is where best, best practice is in this, this country in terms of making sure that you have the care that you need through possibly things like a direct payment or a personal budget that we've been working on and is enshrined in the Care Act, which came in uh, last year. The issue is, though, that if you've, that, that the, the cuts to local authority budgets has meant a 4.6 billion, 31% reduction in its funding to last year. And to stand still this year, we would have needed another 1.1 billion. Robert Halford, that's you then, so, isn't it? So that's we your do, government. We do need to, we absolutely do make, make sure there's caring, compassionate people who can help you to, to, meet, to live the life you want to live, to live a good life. But we need to balance that with appropriate levels of funding. Robert Halford, so, what do you want to say to the Minister? Just, how can me as a grown-up, as a somebody who wants to be an active member of society, be constantly told by not one but multiple agencies that they can't come after a certain time or I have to be I have to get up at a certain time like if I'm only supposed to sleep eight hours a day that means I should have 16 hours to do whatever the, whatever I want to do if it gets cut to eight hours a day if I gave you eight hours and said you only have eight hours a day 
to get up, shower, and do whatever you want to do. I'm sure you wouldn't get much done. Robert Halson. Well, clearly that is wrong. Uh, but uh, the whole idea of the personal care budget was to put you in charge. Without quoting statistics again, the government are putting many billions of pounds into try and improve social care. They, as has been said, they also introduced the precept to allow councils to raise more funds in order to fund but social David care. But David Pearson said there's a big shortfall, isn't there, in how much you need? Th there is a big shortfall, yeah. So that's well, the problem, isn't it? Of course, there will always be a need for more, but many hundreds of billions are going into this area. And, of course, there will always... As I say, there was money that could be increased, but you have to balance a budget on care, you have to balance the budget in terms of funding the NHS, you have to balance the budget in terms of paying for many other things as well. Sorry, what was your point? Why did they the Independent Living Fund, which was set up to avoid the situations that Jackie was in? I'm a lady of a certain age now, right? And I was receiving ILF support from, from when I was 21, until, what was it, 2010? And that enabled me to do all the things that Jackie wants to do, that everybody in this room wants to do. And then they took the decision to close the fund because they said, it's all gonna be lovely under the local authorities. Well, it is not lovely. As Claire said, people are in really, you know, we had the, we had the, um, the launch of Inclusion London's report on the closure of the fund and we were in a room hearing about people, I'm not being funny, but people who are made to wear incontinence pads even though they're not incontinent. You know, there's no life. They're but sitting there. There are many, many people who will tell you the closure of the Independent Living Fund, the clue was in the title, it enabled them to live independently, which is what people with disabilities want. And they feel they can no longer do that because of the closure of that fund. How can you justify well, it? The money was given to local councils, substantial sum of money to local councils, because they are closer to. They are closer to. But that is the fault of the local council for not spending the money in that way. But the whole David idea Pearson. was to bring the decisions closer to everybody. Yes, someone David has Pearson. to stand so, up and so, your so, so I think. I think. That there, are, there are some fantastic examples up and down the country of people living transformed lives by having had the independent living fund and mm. personal budgets and direct payments that are the forerunner of it. There are some, some marvellous examples and it's, it's a great tragedy that that isn't as, as widespread as we would all want. So we need to work together as government, as local authorities, as social care to make sure that we have all those places right Sorry, across the country. Sorry, can I just take a question from the lady at the back? I just want to make a point about the fact that this government wants to get disabled people back to work. They want to bridge the, uh, the, the, the inequality gap between disabled people and able-bodied people in terms of employment. I found employment. I've got to change trains and I've got to go up two flights of stairs and down two flights of stairs within four minutes. For someone with my, my, my mobility problems, that's not exactly the easiest task. So. There's going to be a select committee paper uh, about disability and the built environment, and I'm going to be hopefully contributing to the evidence paper, uh, because I think that society disables us. I think there is such a thing as a social model of disability. Society is disabling me. You want me to work. Can I just... Make my environment more accessible. Work is key. Work is one of the issues that is also talked about. Zoe, you want to work. Tell me why you're not working. I've applied for 100, 200 jobs and I've attended over 150 interviews and I'm getting really fed up. I'm volunteering at a nursery, I've got the right qualifications, I've got a level four, two level fours in early years. What are you going to do to support schools to get, to get disabled people into employment? I mean, Zoe is doing everything right. She's doing everything that your government wants her to do. But she's not being so, rewarded in the way she wants to yeah. be. Well, f first of all, you should be. But let me just say, to set the record before I just go on to what um, needs to be done. Over the last five years, 400 disabled people a day have got jobs. 3.4 million disabled people are now in work. But, of course, more needs to be done. So in my own area, I'm in charge of apprenticeships. We are working very hard to try and get disabled people to do apprenticeships by incentivising employers. So, if, just hold on. If, if, hold on. If, I'm having to crowdfund my transport to college because disabled okay. students. Well, sorry, just, one just, at a time, if you would. We'll come, I'll come on to, to that as many in a moment. I will. I will hold on. Just let me. 
disabilities who are in, I work in FE, so I know the figures here, and you have created a perfect storm that pushes disabled, young people in particular, and adults out of further education. It's often the only place that we have a chance to get a, a, an education where schools, there was bullying or special schooling. It's the first time for a lot of people they can learn, they can feel free, and that they can feel good about themselves. What have you done? 16% of people in further education are people with an impairment or a specific learning disability. 8% in apprenticeships. You are systematically forcing us into, into the nowhere, into nowhere, because the apprenticeships will let's not be available because of the prejudice, the access, the cuts well, let's you've made in Mr. funding has to say. for those okay. things. Let me, thank you. Um, let me just say two things, just to finish, first of all. So just on the apprenticeships, we're saying to employers that if they have a apprentice who is disabled, they have to pay no costs in terms of training. That, the idea is to incentivise employers to make sure that, and we're also uh, going to fund special adaptions if they're needed in terms of employers and uh, give a, uh, existing support to the apprentice. clearly done the training she wants Sorry? to do. Does Zoe has clearly done the training. Yeah. So, so, yeah. That's a massive and, and in drop, terms of, in terms of further education, <laughs> There are two funds. There is, first of all, the bursary that is designed to help vulnerable people, which is many millions of pounds. There is an overall fund that goes to FE colleges in order to help disabled people, uh, which is over 500 million pounds. So there's an enormous amount of money going to try and make sure that disadvantaged students and people with disabilities get into further education, because many people do. And, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry, just one second, if you would. Is, sorry, what, what, how, what's your response to Mr Halfen? Do you feel... Comforted by what he's saying? I've done research in my local authority of nurseries that have, that have employed disabled people, and there's wa only one nursery that, have a that has employed a disabled person. The rest say they don't apply for jobs at, at nurseries. That isn't true, because I have. I've applied for loads of jobs in nurseries. And Victoria, I think it's a I real just, issue. Sorry, just Very quickly. There are things happening in job centres with uh, special disability advisors and so on. But let me just say, let me just say this. Let, let me just make one important, one important point. People with disabilities is your government and its okay. attitude. Okay. Let me just say one important point. Even if. What you are talking about. Okay. Again. Uh, even if, let me just make one important point, even if the government did everything that everyone in this audience wanted, not necessarily, that you have to actually change, as has the whole point yeah. of this debate and the programmes you've been doing, you actually have to change the culture and language so that people are more encouraged. I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to return, excuse well. me, I want to return, sorry Mr Halfon, I, I want to return to, to all of yeah. these issues if we can, um, but I want to touch again on benefits because it's been one of the biggest issues since the coalition, coalition government came in, led by the Conservatives, um, in terms of massive welfare reform affecting many dis, uh, disabled people. Um, what's been your experience? You're one of the people who has been transferred from disability living allowance to the new personal independence payment. Was it a smooth transition for you? <laughs> Not at all, not at all. I was awarded uh, DLA in 1979. My parents fought really hard for it, went through the process. They had used the car until I was old enough to drive and I had a car myself. Um, my disability hasn't changed. I've got cerebral palsy. I was born one pound two ounces. No fault of my own. I'm um, a really educated person. I want to get off my backside and get a decent job. I'm a qualified teacher. I can't get one. I have to do supply work. Without my vehicle, I would have lost that supply work job. But how and would you describe the process for you? The process, um, obviously I had, um, it went through in December to say that they was going through, they were going to assess me. And they actually, in the end, came to my home and interviewed me in my home. I felt very degraded. I felt that I had to justify every single pound that I was given and awarded. I had to justify why I could keep my car. I had to prove that I could do certain things or not do certain things to keep that, that vehicle, and I lost it. Isn't it right that if you are receiving benefits, you should be tested on that? What do you think? Johnny? I mean, from my perspective, I'm, I'm blind and I use a guide dog, and under the government's um, 
new laws, I'm going to be reassessed in case my disability has changed. My disability might have changed. I went to the doctors quite recently. I'm getting blinder, but I'm still going to have to go through this process regardless. And there is something very, very degrading and fundamentally quite insulting when someone says, well, are you really disabled enough? It's like someone metaphorically poking you in the chest. Robert Halfon, on those points, people feel pretty upset, humiliated by this process. It looks as though the targets for saving money will not be made. Hasn't this all been wrong, a waste of time, and actually a lot of people have been hurt in the process? Well, this isn't about saving money. If you look at the PIC, it's actually been extended to help people with mental health, which it never uh, did before. Um, and the idea of the testing is to make sure, the idea of testing... Is yes. it has it all there? So, the idea of testing is to make sure that money is going to those who need it most. Of course, yes. Of course, there may be things that go wrong with the testing and there are injustices that occur. The idea of having it at home was so that because previous experience of people having to travel or having awful experiences and going to places where they had to walk upstairs, no parking and so on and so forth. That is why that people are being tested, because we're trying to make sure so, that the money goes given, to those who most need Very briefly, need it. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but given what people feel about the testing, and that's well known, do you regret any of it? Do you regret voting in these changes, because you did vote for them? I believe in the reforms, um, but I want the testing to be humane. And the government are looking at testing all the time, and they've already made huge... That's one of the reasons, as I say, why some of the testing is happening at home now, which didn't necessarily very rarely happen before okay. in terms of, of some of the other Very briefly, I'm going to have to say the debate now continues on Channel 4 News Facebook page, but from me here at the Aquatic Centre in London and John back in the studio. Goodbye. <laughs>